Hello everyone, welcome to Influencers webinar on name, image, and likeness. I'm the founder and CEO of Influencer, Jim Caval, and I have an awesome panel of guests joining us for today's webinar, including uh, Tom McMillan. Uh, Tom is a retired professional basketball player, also played his college ball at Maryland before playing in the NBA, Rhodes Scholar, and uh, also was a Democratic congressman for um, six years in DC. Um, and is really doing some really cool things now with Lead One, lobbying for uh, FBS schools in a lot of great ways in D.C. And then we're also joined by Darren Heitner. Uh, Darren Heitner from Heitner Law is legal counsel for pro athletes like Antonio Brown, works with Drew Rosenhaus and Rosenhaus Sports, has been featured many times on ESPN's Outside in Florida, who has one of the most progressive NIL bills of any of the states. So first of all, guys, thanks a lot for taking the time and being on this webinar with me. Thank you. Hopefully you can hear me and see me and there's no staff. Yeah, yeah. The full disclaimer, we're, we're starting about uh, five minutes, six minutes after scheduled time because we had some technical difficulties. But yeah, Darren, we can hear you well. And, and Tom also, thanks for joining us. Absolutely, good to be here. So I wanna open up with, uh, with a thought that I want you each to expound on and we'll let you expound on it first, Tom, and then Darren second. And, and so here's the thought. The thought is uh, this NIL stuff affects all of the NCAA institutions greatly, yet it seems like the NCAA is not really taking the lead on what the legislation or bylaws will really be. Well, you have to understand the NCAA is a representative uh, organization and you have to kind of work these legislative processes through, uh, you have to go through a lot of hoops. Uh, and so right now they have a work group trying to um, trying to, to develop the concept. So I, I, I would say that it's still possible, you know, they're going to put up a proposal sometime this spring and that may be uh, something that is the basis for continuing this process at the state and federal government. But to your point, is the NCAA out in front on this? No, the states have been out in front, clearly. Uh, and they're the, they're the ones that are driving this process. Darren, you're in a state, as I mentioned, Florida, that has a pretty progressive bill. And as we know, whatever state leads the way, the others will most likely follow. Um, how do you see this from a standpoint of um, the states leading the charge versus the NCAA, whose institutions are all greatly affected by what's decided, um, leading the charge? So I'll begin with an apology. I actually could not hear a thing that Tom said, so I can't react to anything that he said. I didn't hear it. Um, but with regard to what we're doing here in the state of Florida, we are certainly leading the charge. There was a bill that was introduced by Representative Chip Lamarca here in the state of Florida. And uh, it started off being called the Student Athlete Achievement Act. And uh, it was initially proposed in the House of Representatives. It went through a couple of committees and has been modified tremendously uh, since originally being uh, proposed and sponsored by Representative Lamarca. What we did was we took the California bill that was passed and that is supposed to be enacted in 2023 and modified it with the assistance of others that are reputable in the industry. We called out a lot of criticism and asked for assistance by, by various individuals and came up with an effective date of 2020, July 2020. Uh, what some of you may have read recently is that while our bill has gone through uh, two House committees and is expected to be on the House floor this week, uh, there is uh, there are efforts in the Florida Senate to do uh, to make to have similar momentum. Um, and just yesterday, there was a bill proposed with an amendment that would be essentially a mirror image of what we're proposing in the House, but with an effective date of 2021. Uh, ultimately, what we're doing in the state of Florida is most importantly making sure that athletes, college athletes, have this right to exploit their name, image, and likeness. Um, there have been additives uh, to that piece of legislation. I'm sure we'll get into that. Um, but really why Florida in particular has made headlines is because of that effective date. Whereas California was the first to act and uh, passed a bill and it was signed by the governor. Again, it will not be effective until 2023. In Florida, we wanted to move much quicker. 
initially established in July 2020, and now there may be a debate as to whether it'll be July 2020 or July 2021. That'll be reconciled if the Senate bill passes, then before March 13th, which is the cutoff in the Florida House and Senate, there will have to be reconciliation between the two chambers before it would go to the governor. And Governor Ron DeSantis has uh, stated that he is in support of some type of legislation that will allow college athletes to um, exploit the names, images, and likenesses for uh, for some sort of commercial benefit. You know, again, I didn't hear what Tom stated, but it is interesting that for the longest time the NCAA would not move whatsoever. I can't even say that it was at a snail's pace. Uh, in fact, you had the NCAA equate this to opening Pandora's box. Now, that's some strong rhetoric. Now, we've seen a, a tremendous shift recently with all the various states, over 20 of them looking at this type of legislation, including the state of Florida, where it's not so much about opening Pandora's box. We now have the NCAA seemingly rallying around it, but they want to control the process and perhaps tie these benefits to educational opportunities, which is a bit vague, um, although you can look to the O'Bannon case to really determine exactly what they're looking for. The problem is the NCAA, because it wasn't proactive, is sort of late to the game. And you have various congressmen on the federal level who are looking to um, put their name, attach their name to some sort of legislation, but there's a lack of unity. So that's why it's so important for states like Florida to continue the momentum and hopefully put pressure on either the NCAA or uh, federal Congress to take some action. Ultimately, all of us want some sort of unity and federal action, it just has to look right. And we think that what we're proposing in the state of Florida is a great model. Well, I, I smirked when you said lack of unity, because I think that's, you know, really the elephant in the room here is, you know, it's it's tough enough if a, if a business or a league or any type of organization has two leaders, you know, co-CEOs, we've seen people try it. I feel like there's 2,000 in this case between conference commissioners and athletic directors and university presidents and the NCAA and then congressmen and women um, in the government side of things. It seems like there's a lot of people with a lot of different initiatives. Um, Tom, you know politics and the government a lot more than, than I do. I'd love to hear your breakdown of that aspect, this whole idea that we need unity to figure out the route ahead. Well, there's no question that you have to have a, a common goal that you're pursuing to get legislation done. It's hard enough passing legislation in this Congress uh, with the rancor and election year approaching and all the different variables, uh, a calendar year that's going to be shortened because of the election year. So it's a, it's a difficult process at best. And you have a lot of different coalitions. You have, you know, a hundred new, hundred women in the House. You have 50 members of the Black Caucus who are going to be looking at this as a civil rights issue. You have some Republicans who believe that this is a state's rights issue. The federal government shouldn't be in, in it in the first place. So it's a it's a very difficult process putting together. Uh, people that look at the NCAA say, well, why don't they work move quicker? Well, it, it is a, there's no question it's a bureaucratic, slow organization, but you know, that's what happens when you have 1,200 institutions in a system. Uh, and, and clearly, the states are pushing the envelope here. Uh, my own prediction is it's going to be hard to get legislation done this year. We could very well be into next year. The new president, whether it's uh, Trump or someone else, is going to have a big say in this. And uh, this could drag out a while. This may not be resolved overnight. And meanwhile, you've got many different states, 29 right now, all taking, you know, taking slightly different positions on this issue. Florida obviously has their own unique provisions. Um, my, my gut on this is that if enough states move ahead on this, it's, it's going to be really hard to get federal legislation passed that would really uh, strongly preempt state actions. And, and there's a political reason for that. In next year, all the members of Congress are dependent upon their state legislatures to draw their districts. They're up for redistricting. And so the last thing you want to do as a congressman is go say to your senator who just passed an NIL bill, listen, 
we got to change your bill because it's got flaws, doesn't have enough guardrails, pretty open-ended on recruiting, transfers, and so forth. And so th there's a political process here at work, too. So this is a difficult process. I think it's uh, a complicated issue. I don't think that most legislators are fully aware of all the nuances. I mean, the biggest concern of our ADs is that you know, uh, an NIL benefit will not be given to a student athlete because of their intrinsic value, but rather to recruit them to a school or get them to transfer to another school. That's very hard to regulate, but that is the task ahead. And we'll see what the NCAA comes back with in the end of April. Well, Darren, I know you're having uh, still having some technical issues that we're working on with you so that you can hear Tom. But I think ultimately, you know, what we're talking about is who's going to lead the charge. And Tom talked a little bit about how hard it is in uh, a year like this year with an election going on and a lot of different initiatives within the House and the Senate, um, you know, from uh, Republicans, some of which who think this is a state by state issue um, to um, this becoming a civil rights issue, uh, which is something that with 50 members uh, coming from the Black Caucus, um, that's that's a, a real thing. And, um, and so I think this whole idea of, of who's going to lead the charge is what everybody's trying to figure out. Um, we even have a question from our audience. Uh, is the NCAA committee report date of April 2020 early enough, given how fast the states are moving? And I think that's a good question for you, um, based on everything I just shared that Tom and I were talking about. In my estimation, it is not. There was recently a committee uh, on Capitol Hill that was convened, and you had a lot of senators uh, voice their own opinions. Uh, you had uh, Mark Emmert, uh, and you had uh, certain conference directors, and I believe uh, an athletic director, and Ramogi Huma, who's led the charge from an athlete's perspective. And I thought it was very insightful. You had certain senators who were extremely vocal um, and challenged uh, Mark Emmert with regard to his statement that nothing yet has even been written. Um, Penn has not gone to paper with regard to any proposal whatsoever and will not until April 2020. And it, it's not that it cannot be. Uh, certainly, time is of the essence here, particularly with a state like Florida that has shown an intention to move very swiftly. Um, and then to provide a true uh, proposal by the beginning of 2021, I think, is much too big of a gap when you have such sincere interest on a state-by-state -state basis. And certainly, I, I don't think that there is any basis to challenge a particular state from adopting this type of legislation. We have not yet heard the NCAA come out and, and specifically and explicitly indicate that it would file a lawsuit against, against a particular state and the specifics of what the challenge would be. Many individuals have provided an opinion as to whether the NCA would and what the uh, legal foundation would be in such an instance. But I think you're right. There is a challenge from a federal level as to, one, the immediacy and urgency to pass this type of legislation. It is an election year, and this is not necessarily, while it is a hot button issue, and there's a lot of discussion, particularly in sports-related circles, it is not necessarily the most pressing issue for the government to to look at. And, and with the impeachment hearings, I can tell you that for some time, everyone said, this is what we're preoccupied with. Um, and then it's a matter of figuring out who will lead the charge. And there are various individual senators, Mitt Romney, Marco Rubio, just yesterday from the state of Florida, indicated his interest in, in supporting this type of legislation. But who will really lead the charge and propose and put his or her name sponsoring a piece of legislation that everyone can rally around? And I think what's key is not to lose focus. That's the biggest problem. And you find this um, in certain states and also by, with regard to certain legislators on the national level. Don't expand this beyond name image likeness to include college athletes to earn some sort of money either on a salary or as a commission related to the ticket sales. Now we're getting into Title IX issues. Now we're getting into very complex monetary issues setting aside the legal issues related to Title IX. So I think 
the unfortunate consequence is sometimes we have this very unique discussion about name, image, and likeness, monies that would not run through the universities but would be strictly between third parties and the college athletes themselves. In my estimation, no Title IX challenge whatsoever, but you have individuals taking that and trying to expound upon that, and that is unfortunate. an unfortunate consequence of that is, in my estimation, the college athlete continues to suffer by not having this right that they should have. So I think it, 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 a unified stance would be great. The challenge is finding the leader who will take the appropriate bill, again, I'm biased, but I think we have a very strong one in the state of Florida, and then putting that on the floor on the federal level. Hopefully that something like that would move more quickly than the NCAA, but to be honest, I don't think either the NCAA or the federal government will move fast enough to preclude individual states from continuing to debate legislation and ultimately pass it. I do think at a minimum, you'll have the state of Florida with a law that enacts the name, image, and likeness rights by July 2021. And if I had to guess after yesterday, I would think we push it back from 2020 to 2021, which is still pretty quick. Admittedly, if we were to pass legislation by March, put it on the governor's desk to sign in April, three months may not be long enough. So by adding a year, I think the colleges in the state understand this is an issue that they need to rally around at this point, but they also want enough time to put the right instrumentalities into place to protect themselves. And we can get into what those instrumentalities can be if you want. Tom, any thoughts on that? I think that uh, Florida was clearly the first state that was going to come and be effective immediately. When I say immediately this year, there is fear as you look at 29 other states that some of them could could advance the legislation till this year and then obviously the ncaa is going to have to rely on injunctions to try to slow them down until they can finish their process i think the if you listen to the hearing last week it's clear these members really don't have a clue as to what should be done they're looking for guidance and so, and so are we, so all of, our, all of our ADs looking for guidance. So we're very interested in what the work group comes up with. And um, my gut is that it's extremely difficult to get federal preemptive language le legislation done. Uh, it, it certainly won't get done this year. And then next year, you have a whole other set of issues coming into throw. One is you're going to have, as I said, redistricting. Number two, you're going to have a new president or, uh, you know, a, a, or the same president reelected, and they're going to have a voice in this as well. So this could go on for some time before there's resolution on it. And as I said, at some point in time when so many states act, it makes it even more difficult at the federal level. Um, we have a few other questions in our uh, in our thread. One was a couple from from Emmett Gill. Um, one is, uh, uh, where is the college athlete voice? I, th I assume you mean here on the webinar. Um, we we wanted to have a college athlete on, but they weren't allowed to because they can't use their name, image, and likeness with influencer. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, keep asking questions. We'll try to get to them as we go later. Listen, you know, you know, well, I, can I can I say something about that? I do. I think all of our ADs fully understand that the rights of publicity for a student athlete are intrinsically theirs. And that does not include the uniform or the jersey, but that athletes rights of publicity, name, image and likeness are intrinsically that athletes. And so no one is fighting that issue. I don't think there's too many of our ADs who doesn't don't think that's fair. So sure. when you talk about the college athlete being represented, I think that I think it's important that their voice be heard. And I think that this system has to be a balance. And it also has to fit into our system of higher education in this country. Uh, one of the fears that I have, having worked on these issues for almost 30 years, is that we are moving very quickly and towards full professionalization of our campuses. And I, I, I completely understand why the athletes are asking for this, particularly with the salaries and everything else that's been spent.
But the bigger question for higher in America is, what do we want our college sports teams to look like on our college campuses? Do we want them to look like collegiate programs or do we want them to look like pro programs? And I think that's going to be the bigger question that Congress may end up grappling with uh, even, even while they're looking at NIL. They may ask the question, we spend $100 billion on higher ed. What do we want it to look like in terms of college sports on our campuses? Well, I think it's a perfect segue into some of the aspects that are affected by NIL, forgetting about some of the other things that this could end up being about. Like you mentioned, Darren, this could turn into topics around uh, salary and, and, and then you bring in Title IX and a lot of these other things. But just with NIL, you've got, you know, a lot of questions that, you know, when I have the, the opportunity to, to get together with ADs of schools that we serve, these these topics come up all the time and, and they're like main categories and then there's like a bunch of subcategories per yeah representation compensation team contracts um, health and disability insurance uh, financial literacy and life skills workshop requirements and all of them have a rabbit hole you can go down with a lot of questions that will arise uh, darren i want to start with you on the representation topic you know, because I know you are able to represent a lot of professional athletes. Um, I mean, if student athletes can be represented by an agent or an attorney licensed in the state, uh, give me a little bit of a, give me an explanation of, of the difference in services provided to a professional athlete um, and then any additional factors that might uh, play into how these, um, this representation uh, will, will work with student athletes. Certainly. So first of all, to be clear, I'm an attorney. I'm not an agent. Uh, that said, uh, and, and I should also say if. Yeah, you provide legal counsel, not not represent from an agent. There's actually standpoint. nothing that precludes me from currently providing legal counsel to college athletes. However, college athletes cannot sign agency contracts with rep representatives who would negotiate their contracts. Now, what we are firm believers of is that these athletes, if we're going to put them in a position where they're now able to procure opportunities for themselves and negotiate these deals, they need to have the ability to have counsel. And that counsel can come in the form of an attorney or an agent. Now, what we've talked about in the state of Florida is limit the representation to those individuals who are licensed to practice law in the state of Florida or who are certified as athlete agents in the state of Florida. And one, in, one issue that we've discussed internally is should we make it harder for an individual to become licensed in our state of Florida, which is regulated by the Department of uh, Business, uh, DBPR. Um, and so currently you have a background check, you get your fingerprints taken, you pay a fee and you're licensed as, a, as an athlete agent. And that allows you uh, the ability to recruit student athletes um, who come from the state of Florida and then represent them in their professional capacities. We would not in any way alter the athlete agent laws that would now allow for an agent to sign some sort of professional representation con contract with a player. For instance, in the NFL, the NFL Players Association calls them SRA, Standard Representation Agreements. In the NBA, the National Basketball Players Association calls them SPACs, Standard Player Agent Contracts. Those would still be off limits. The, the limitation would be that an agent or an or an attorney would have the right to sign a representation agreement, a retainer agreement with a college athlete simply so that the athlete has the right to representation and can have some assistance in finding opportunities. And again, understanding the legal constructs that surround the contractual relationship that they're going to be entering into. And we think that's very important to not make it so that they are enabled to have that type of representation on what can be a very important contract. Um, so we've contemplated already, at least in our state, how the laws need to be amended in order to afford for this type of opportunity, um, but also how to make it potentially a bit stricter and, and, and be a gatekeeper in a sense to make it so that not just anybody can become a certified agent in our state. Years and years ago, decades ago, the state of Florida actually required individuals to pass a test in order to become certified as agents within the state. We scrapped that, that requirement 
And I'm not aware of any other state that currently has a test that an agent must or that an individual must pass to become certified within the state. Meanwhile, you do have the players' associations, such as the NFLPA, NBPA, Major League Baseball Players Association, that do require that agents show competency before they're certified by way of passing an examination. So I think that's something that states should look into, including our state of Florida. And once again, with each of these categories, there's you answer that one with other questions and then there's a, you know, a lot more that, that can come with it, but another category is compensation. And Tom, I want to um, bring this up with you, uh, get your take. I mean, this, uh, this model will create a situation of, of new income for student athletes that's never existed before. You talked earlier about um, what do we want college sports and higher education to be uh, when it comes to collegiate athletics? You know, the protection of scholarships, grant and aid, uh, should a student athlete also receive compensation for their name, image, and likeness is something that people bring up. Will the protection of, of scholarship and grant and aid be there? Um, or is, is that something that's on the table to maybe go away because student athletes are able to, to now garner this, this whole new revenue stream? It's a very good question. There are unintended consequences that we do not fully understand. Number one, if you're on a Pell Grant and you're getting up to six thousand some dollars a year, uh, and you take outside income, that could impact your Pell Grant. Number two, you're going to have income tax record reporting requirements. The kids are going to have to, you know, disclose this income to the federal government. And, and number three is the fact that. Uh, the whole IRS and how they approach college sports may change. To date, they have been very lenient in the way, in how they have treated, from a tax perspective, student athletes. They allow them to take room, board, tuition, books, cost of attendance, unlimited food, health care, and they allow them to get that without really enforcing any taxability on that. When the tax code is very narrow on that, tax code really only allows tuition, fees, and books. And so doesn't include room and board, doesn't include cost of attendance. So one of the un unintended consequences, I think, is that this could open up some doors with the IRS. We don't know what that is, but there, this will not be just without consequences. And I think student athletes have to understand that. To the point that we were talking about earlier about representation, I, you know, I've always argued that these kids should have representation. I mean, this is a big decision in their life, and it's inevitable. By the way, all the 29 bills that have been put out there, all of them uniformly allow agent and representation uh, in those bills. So I'm pretty sure that whatever comes out will have something in that along that line. Yeah, and as you mentioned, some of the stuff you mentioned with the IRS, it also, so I hear a lot of, well, we don't want any unfair advantages, right? You hear that a lot. But the reality is, is there's already advantages and disadvantages that certain schools, conferences um, have based on geography, based on prestige and history of their program, based on their fan network that comes with that prestige and the support they have. I mean, there's already advantages and disadvantages. That's why there's division one, II, division two, II, division three. That's why there's power five or autonomous five conferences. And then there's group of five and so on and so forth. So I, I really feel like we need to eliminate that unfair advantage thing to an extent because that's just the reality. But when you bring up IRS, geez, isn't it different if you play at a school in Florida versus if you play at a school in California, just based on tax laws and those kinds of things, Darren? I mean, isn't there going to be some advantages just based on what taxes look like in a state? Uh, absolutely. And again, <laughs> I'm addressing your comment without hearing what Tom stated, but the the IRS issue is there, there's no, with regard to what we're proposing in the state of Florida, there's no issue with from perspective of the academic institutions and how their status may change with the IRS. Again, we're strictly talking about money's flowing from third parties directly to the college athletes without. So let me stop you. Tom brought up a great point, which is to this to this point in time, the IRS has been very lenient with the student athlete as far as the stipends and other dollars that come with their scholarship money that help them live, books, tuition, unlimited food, housing, right. all these things, right? 
And that could change with this, right? Based on my question. And that's where, um, you know, there's, there's going to be uh, a little bit of the unknown. Well, I, I, I try not to fall for slip, slippery slope arguments. Um, there's no indication that the IRS is in any way going to change the status of scholarships and how they're taxed. Uh, a lot of the income that's received by college athletes in the form of scholarships is not taxable income. There are certainly exceptions under the current tax laws. And again, with regard to states changing their laws on a state-by-state -state basis, there is absolutely no indication that there's going to be some sort of retaliation by the federal government in the form of the IRS and changing the tax laws in any which way. But to what you asked prior, could there be an advantage for Florida schools as opposed to California schools? Perhaps. And it's sort of the same as what happens in the, in the professional ranks where if yeah. an athlete is offered $10 million from a professional team in California and $10 million from a professional team in Florida, that athlete and his or her tax advisor should think about the fact that he or she is going to be taxed on his or her income in the state of California, whereas in Florida there is zero income tax whatsoever. So to the extent that a school wants to use that as a competitive advantage, God bless them. They already use things like facilities and right. the, history of the programs and the colleges and so on, and, and the coaches and so on and so forth. There's no real competitive balance in college sports. <laughs> exactly. Uh, there's no salary caps. There's no salaries. So so those who, who make the argument that there's going to be lapses or, or, or distinctions in competition between the haves and the have nots, well, open up your eyes. It already exists. And right. I don't think that the balance as it currently exists will change in any way. Perhaps a, a school like my Florida Gators get a little bit closer to Alabama Crimson Tide because of the fact that we have advantageous tax laws. But even that, I, I can't necessarily, I don't necessarily think that athletes are going to be picking an educational institution simply because of the tax laws within a given state. We had a question from, from the audience. Um, one, of our, uh, one of our listeners uh, asked earlier, uh, for Tom, what he uh, what he thinks about uh, Anthony Gonzalez, former Ohio State wide receiver, now a Republican in the state of Ohio uh, in Congress, um, has released talking points uh, about a week and a half ago on NIL. Um, I want to ask you your opinion on those talking points, Tom, but also um, just given your experience, I um, want you to kind of go back into the timeline topic. So we'll, we'll do timeline second. I'll, I'll give you an exact uh, question to, to the timeline that I think you have some some good perspective on. But first, did you get a chance to look at, at Anthony Gonzalez's talking points? Yeah, I know, and I have them in front of me. I actually, you know, what he's talking about is federal preemption uh, to create one uniform standard. Whenever you open up the gates of Congress, there's no, there's no guarantee that it's going to be limited to NIL. It could go much, much beyond that. So federal preemption is a is a double-edged sword. It's not always going to be what you expect it to be. If you looked at that hearing last week, there were some Congress senators who were very keen on making this a civil rights issue. It may open up a whole compensation stream for college athletes that, that we haven't been discussing today. Um, it also, you know, Gonzalez says, let's preserve this college system that we love. And I agree with that. Uh, but the college system has to be a balanced college system that fits into higher ed. And finally, um, you know, he talks about protecting the student athlete as an amateur, ensuring legal clarity that they're not considered employees. I agree with the employee part of that. I think the word amateur has always been a word that really is is probably based on my experiences in the Olympics. I wish we could find another word because amateur is the foundation for a lot of the legal cases, but it is somewhat anachronistic. Generally, what I'd say his principles are sound uh, with some with some amendments. Now, you asked me about timeline, how long to get a bill done. When I when we passed the student right to know bill when I was in Congress, which required disclosure of graduation rates, which heretofore weren't done, that took us 20 months. And we, we had a we had a Democratic Congress and Democratic Senate. Uh, the Amateur Sports Act in the 70s, which was a comprehensive reform bill, took about four years to get done. So, given the climate in Congress, 
I would say you're looking at a process that's at least a year to two years long. So Darren, I asked Tom about timeline um, after he he talked through Anthony Gonzalez's talking points, which had to do with preemptive federal involvement. But timeline wise, you know, this is a, a one to two year process based on, you know, who's in office and being an election year. It's kind of where, where Tom stands on that. Well, before I get to my next question, do you have any response to that timeline assessment? One to two years? Yeah. I think that's, I, I, you're talking about from federal action or the NCAA action. I think just in general, federal. Uh, Tom, what would you say to that? Fe I'm responding talking? to congressional actions. After congressional. the, after okay. the yeah, NCAA. I, I would hope so. Yeah. Um, again, I think it's a matter of getting everybody on the same page and understanding that we're simply talking about a name image likeness issue and staying on force and not trying to add too much to the piece of legislation and make it so convoluted that it ultimately fails. Um, Look, ultimately what we're trying to do, one of the things that we're trying to do in Florida is push this conversation so that there's movement as quickly as possible. I, I talked uh, earlier today with somebody about the fact that California currently has an effective date of 2023, but what happens if Florida passes legislation right. and it has an enactment date of 2021, could California go back and amend its law to be effective earlier? Absolutely. Could Florida pass legislation that's effective July 2021? And if there's enough progress on the federal level, decide to table the enactment. Absolutely, these things can change over time. Even after a piece of legislation is signed into law, you could have a revised piece of legislation, governor signing it and a delay. But one to two years would be uh, fantastic on the federal level. I, I, I had a lot of energy and hope uh, in association with our movement in FAR and, and I was hopeful that we would get something passed and enacted with an effective date of this year that may be stalled for a year. So if it's July 2021, look, I think the bottom line is these are rights that the college athletes should have. So the sooner that they get them, the better. You look across the entire country and everyone has the opportunity to exploit his or her name, image and likeness for commercial gain. But for some reason, we've restricted college athletes from this. And I understand from the NCAA's perspective, it's about latching on and retaining this amateurism status uh, and treating college athletes as amateurs. I have a big issue of using the term student athlete, so I'm happy that in the state of Florida, we've actually changed the bill from uh, Student Athlete Achievement Act to Intercollegiate Athlete Bill of Rights. Um, but the bottom line is, these are athletes who attend universities and are there for educational purposes, but they're also obviously there to perform on the field, on the court, et cetera. To ignore that they should be earning some sort of compensation from everything that they provide to their respective universities, I think is, is completely unfair. So the sooner the better, if it's a year from now, great. I hope I'll, I'll challenge Tom, let's get a year as opposed to one to two. <laughs> Well, and, and Tom, really, his his last thought about the student athlete really goes into what you were saying about about amateurism and and the way it needs to be really looked at at the college level. Is that a question for me? Yeah, I mean, you know, he he brings up like, yes, these are students, but at the same time, you know, they're they're performing and representing the university um, at a, at a high level, and I think it really plays into what you were saying in your last answer regarding what amateurism really is in college sports. We have to sit back and say, how did we get here? Right. In 1984, there was a Supreme Court decision that basically the NCAA lost its television monopoly and that drove rampant commercialization of college sports. Uh, that's what's happened. That was predicted at the time. So we should not be surprised where one side has made you know enormous money and the other side, the student athletes are saying, I want a piece of it. What happens with name, image, and likeness, which is an intrinsic right, I agree with uh, I agree with everybody on that point, is that the question that we will ask ourselves down the road is when three Duke players are making $150,000 in name, image, and likeness, what will that mean? By the way, represented by attorneys and agents, what will that mean to the rest of the team and to college sports in general? Will that lead to the boycott of an NCAA tournament? Will that lead to further professionalization of college sports? Those are questions that are, you know, bigger than all of us.
but they are questions we have to ask ourselves as a country, because do we want, you know, full professionalization of college campuses? And even though I completely understand where athletes are coming from, I wrote a book about this in 1991. We just have to do this with our eyes open because it could change how we look at higher education in this country. There's no doubt about it. Um, all right, I want to kind of get into closing thoughts. We only have we have a little less than 10 minutes left. Um, I didn't, of course, get through the the five categories of questions and thoughts that that I mentioned earlier. They were representation, compensation, team contracts, health and disability insurance, and and financial literacy and life skills. I think like almost every bullet that you get from folks fits into some of those categories. But Darren, your closing thought kind of for those who are working in college sports, what can people do if they're working in a college athletic department to, um, first of all, acknowledge that this isn't a matter of if, but when, and they've chosen a career in an industry that's about to radically change. Um, But in addition to acknowledging that, how can they um, be on the front end, be proactive, be ahead of the curve based on on, on being in this industry and working uh, in a college athletics department? Well, I know that in Florida, we've called on various stakeholders. We've spoken with athletic directors at every major institution. Um, we've, talked about, we've talked with various individuals who are within athletic uh, departments at the various universities, and we want their insight. We want to hear what their challenges will be. I mean, one thing that we took into consideration was that the California law in our minds was deficient because it really allowed individuals, athletes, to enter into deals with third parties prior to being enrolled on college campuses. And we thought in Florida, we want to restrict that. We don't want there to be this undue influence. Believe us, that's not what we're trying to accomplish. We want to avoid boosters from being able to persuade athletes to to attend a particular university. Once the athlete is enrolled, that's when we really are partners in a sense. The, the, and I say that we, the, the athletes, the attorneys, the agents, and the athletic department. And I think what's really important is to try to route out any sort of impropriety. It exists currently with boosters having undue influence. We don't want these endorsement opportunities or exploitation of rights of publicity to turn into boosters finding a new opportunity to spread money to the athletes. And additionally, we think that the college campuses will serve as very, very important gatekeepers. Compliance departments will become more instrumental in this entire process of making sure that there is no impropriety. And these deals that are going to be entered into between the athletes and third parties will need to first be checked by the compliance departments or as high up as the athletic director at the universities. Again, it's not about money flowing through the universities and to the athletes, but instead the universities will serve in the gatekeeper role to ensure that no contract that's entered into by an athlete is in any way in conflict with the contracts that the schools have already entered into with third parties. And I've talked about this with various individuals, and one example that I oftentimes provide is the apparel deal between the NFL and Nike. Athletes, when they're on the field of play, must wear the approved Nike apparel. But you also have many athletes in the NFL who sign separate deals with Adidas, with Puma, with other brands, and they can use that apparel off the field. Depending on what these contracts state between the universities and the third parties will determine what deals the athletes can enter into. But most importantly, this is not something where we think that the universities are going to lose out on any economic opportunity. If anything, we believe that the schools will be incentivized in the sense that brands will now realize they not only have the opportunity to affiliate with the universities, but those same big brands can also potentially affiliate with the individual athletes, providing additional value. We see it in the professional ranks. So ultimately, there will be roles for the universities to play, most importantly, in a gatekeeper capacity ensuring that, best ensuring that there's no impropriety. Tom, what do you think about that? As, as far as your closing thought, I'd like you to focus on, um, is this a new revenue opportunity like Darren's talking about um, for the institutions or um, 
the other side uh, of it is, could this cannibalize um, the revenue of the institution? What are your thoughts on that? I don't think we know yet. I think it could be a win-win where uh, a rising, you know, rising sea raises all boats. I think that's very possible where the athletes in school win. I could also project out where programs are cut at the at the school level because sponsors decide to cannibalize and rather put their money towards student athletes than schools. Who knows? I, I do know one thing. This is a complicated issue. <laughs> we need to get it right. As more states jump into this and move ahead, it will be harder to get federal legislation passed. And I think that uh, what we see happening are, what we could very well see happening are lots of unintended consequences. Let me just give you one perspective from an AD. An AD now has to attest that they are in compliance with rules and regs with the NCAA. And some legal scholars think that could be potentially criminal liability for some of our ADs if they falsely attested. Now ADs are going to have to attest that third parties, all the relationships with third parties are in order. And, and it's going to complicate that for the AD. So as we move down this brave new world, just realize it's not without consequences and it will, we'll have to adjust to it to make it work in the years to, years to come. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt. I think what we've, what we've talked about today is, is great context for future conversations. There's no doubt that um, this is a very complex topic. Um, and even if there wasn't an election coming up, um, you know, it is not a, an overnight thing. Um, there are simplicities to it that I think Florida is trying to um, do a good job of, of putting together to help people not make it more than it is, but it's still much, there's much to it. There's much to it. And new liabilities, whether it's for an AD to your comment just now, Tom, um, or to a student athlete with the unknowns around the IRS, um, liabilities and responsibilities are going to arise depending on what's decided. And listen, for me, um, to have you two come on this is an honor uh, to have uh, the folks who are able to show up and and consume this, along with uh, the uh, the podcast listeners, this will be packaged up and put out on our podcast is awesome. But I think it's just the beginning. It's just the catalyst for future conversations. And um, I'll tell you what, Emmett, we will have athletes on. Don't worry. There's there's uh, some recent graduates who I know would love to talk about this, and I think we're going to be able to get some ads on to talk about this. And a year ago, that wasn't even possible. Because a year ago, I think it wasn't a matter of if, but when. A lot of people thought that it was an if. But people are starting to get their arms around the fact that it is going to happen. And um, all of us just want to arm ourselves with as much information as possible. And you two have a lot of wisdom and knowledge that you just bestowed upon myself and, uh, and our listeners today. I'm very thankful for that. So thank you both for making the time. Thank you for all those who are able to listen um, and watch and uh, we will be back with more on this topic in the Influencer webinar series and on my I Want Your Job podcast series throughout the rest of 2020 as this uh, unfolds and becomes what, uh, what many of us uh, know will be a changing of the guard for college athletics.